Hello everybody, it's Wyvern here with another bit of Dawn War, Warmer 2, Quick Match Gameplay. This time we're on Gorkazan playing as the Beastmen against the Force of the High Elves. And in this match, I kind of went in against an opponent who kind of rushed things. He definitely was ready to very, very quickly. He uh, wasn't really confirming that he was High Elves or not, and then just got ready to. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't really starting my build because I wasn't sure if my opponent was going to run High Elves or anything else until uh, it was late, so I felt very pressured, and this build was kind of thrown up together very quickly, and that's why you see the front line of Angor Spears, for example. But one of the things I did want to try out was Cygors. Now, normally, I try to run builds that don't involve a Cygor camping, but going into this one, I figured, you know what, why not? For my lord, I'm bringing Malagor the Dark Omen. Now, Malagor has his issues. He's very weak in melee. Granted, this was buffed recently. Uh, I also do believe he got slightly better mobility, but... He's very, very susceptible to getting gooned out and sniped. That said, he does have some pretty cool things going for him. He's got Icons of Vilification, which is an AoE plus 12 leadership aura. He does have Unholy Power, giving him more wounds of magic, on top of the Arcane Conduit that he has. And then he does have the uh, Something Wicked This Way comes, which is a minus 4 leadership debuff in AoE, which is not terrible. Now, obviously, High Elves have very high leadership, especially there's their, even their line infantry like Spears, Moth, and Seaguard, those lower end troops, will still hold up pretty well, but still, minus 4 leadership is nice on top of Fear and Terror that we can get with other units. For spells, we did bring Devolve to Nuke Blobs if it came to it, Mantle of Gorok for the buffs, uh, and then Savage Dominion, hoping to get good value out of Cygors. I figured that if my opponent didn't go with a sort of infantry-heavy build or Cav and infantry-heavy build, I, we would want the Mantle of Gorok and Devolve to make us more competitive against other units. Now, alongside it, we do have a bit of an anti-large goon squad in the back here, a Gorbel. He is fully kitted out. Uh, if we look at his, or not fully kitted out, but he's got all of his basic abilities. He's got Foe Seeker, he's got Deadly Onslaught, and he does have Slaughter's Call, which is a cool ability. He gives plus 8 leadership, and plus 5 melee attack, and a little bit of charge bonus when he's in melee, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, Beastmen don't always have the best of stats, especially their leadership tends to suffer, so being able to boost it up with a Gorbel is definitely very nice. Alongside of the Butchers of Kalkengard, providing that extra little bit of it. oomph. Obviously, they're not dedicated anti-large, but I think the Silver Shields and Armor and Regen are much more important than, say, the anti-large of Minotaurs with Great Weapons. For the front line here, it is simply all on Gore Spears with shields. Uh, there are There's a single unit that's unshielded over here on the flank that's got a few Chevrons because, like I said, I was running out of time. And there we do have two units of Angor Raiders here in the center looking to chip away at enemy uh, skirmishers like Elyrian Reavers or perhaps harass uh, infantry, that sort of stuff. Obviously not the most amazing unit, but I figured, you know, as a zoning tool, they're okay. On one flank, we do have the Sons of Goros as well as some Chaos Warhounds. On the other one, simply Chaos Warhounds with Poison. And these guys will be looking to harass and flank and pincer my opponent. That said, my opponent decided to go with a very wide, very infantry heavy build. And we can see here, for his lord, he is running with a prince. So nothing much to be said there. The prince is simply mounted on a horse, which drops his shield to bronze instead of a silver that he's normally got. But uh, he still does have Foe Seeker, Deadly Onslaught, and Sandy Ground, so still very, very solid. And very tanky for a budget. He's, uh, it costs almost nothing, and his tankiness is honestly almost on par with Tyrion. For his main line, my opponent has a whole bunch of white lines who will absolutely demolish my poor Angor Spears. And they are backed by a whole bunch of spearmen. You can see two spearmen on this flank, and then uh, two more spearmen on this flank. So, very, very wide infantry build. And then for his main line, he's got some Loth and Seagirt with shields. And then a core composed entirely of vanilla archers. So, four units of archers and two Loth and Seagirt there. So, a lot of DACA potentially. And then there are two Illyrian Reavers to harass and poke away at my troops. So, definitely an interesting build. Definitely actually has decent counters to basically anything Beastmen can bring, but it's very immobile, which I think is a mistake. Now you can see the white lines over here are getting dumpstered by the Eye of Moore's Leap, really getting torn apart. And unfortunately, Winds of Magic this game are very, very low starting out, so I wasn't able to summon a cycle early on at all. Uh, but you can see now, as my opponent is pushing in with his archers, I'm countering by pushing out the spears. This might seem a little silly, but I really don't want my opponent getting in range of the Eye of Moore's Leap. In the meantime, the cavalry is looking for an opportunity to get around the flank, uh, while these guys are going to rush straight down the pipe looking to crush these white lions and potentially get in on the back line. You can see the rocks flying in against the archers, doing quite a bit of work, knocking down 11 models there, doing quite a lot. In the meantime, the whittled down white lions will start to string these on war spears very, very quickly, unfortunately, but uh, at least we will buy ourselves some time that way. While in the meantime, on the flanks, our cavalry is looking for an opportunity to jump into the back line. And obviously my opponent here has huge width. He actually outnumbers me by a tangible amount, which is definitely a problem for myself. But uh, we're looking to hopefully uh, break through and uh, drive in deep and really butcher my opponent here in the back. Now here the prince is attempting to do an intercept on these uh, Gorbul, on the Gorbul and the Butcher of Kalkengard, but we kind of shrug him off at first. 
Uh, you can't see he has popped his, all of his abilities, and so we turn around and we're going to engage him. Now my opponent, big mistake, did not bring a caster, so any damage we do to this prince is permanent. Uh, and so despite standing your ground and all that going off, we are going to be able to lay the smackdown in pretty good. Corbel there di diving in and forces in the prince to reconsider his life decisions. Unfortunately, this is exposed my butchers to a whole bunch of withering fire to the rear, but we're able to sort of realign ourselves and come chasing once again. And anytime we are breaching the backline, you can see over here these Sons of Goros and the Chaos Warhounds are getting in on the flank of the Italian Reavers, getting the charge off, getting a little bit of damage, kind of getting a few swings in there. But realizing that my opponent's leader Reavers are pulling away, we're actually going to re-target ourselves and get in on these archers and start breaking apart those backlines. While in the meantime, the front line has completely given way. If we look, our Ongor Spear is in full flight. My opponent chasing with his white lines. But... Things are not all bleak. Now, these Ongor Spears over here are rallying with their superior mobility. My opponent, very concerned about the back line, was not been on top of his micro here in the front. And we have gotten our first Cygor summon. And our Ongor Raiders are now unloading on these White Lions, who, despite their 90 armor and 30% missile resist, are definitely going to start feeling the pressure. In the meantime, over here, the Gorbal is slugging out with some archers, while over here, the Ongor Spears actually managed to muck up both Lothan Seaguard and these Leering Reavers, which is a big win for me. And elsewhere, the uh, Butchers of Kalkengard running amok at, alongside the Gorbul, destroying the backline over here. In the meantime, these Sons of Gorus, as well as the Chaos Warhounds, destroying these Lyrian Reavers and these Archers and really crippling my opponent's backline uh, defenses. And this is very, very significant because now my opponent is going to find himself without the ability to control the mobility game. He's not going to be able to restrict my uh, maneuvers with Saigors, with Gor Butchers, with the uh, Sons of Gorus. I'm going to be able to start cycle charging and be a nuisance that way. Elsewhere in the meantime, over here, the Spears desperately trying to snag these white lines and force them to fight. Uh, elsewhere in the meantime, these guys are rallying and actually managed to push off some of the white lines, which is nice. Hungo Raiders are going to start pressuring these guys. And Saigor, of course, white lines not the best melee defense-wise, so if we're able to debuff their, their melee defense just enough, we're able to drop their martial prowess, they're going to start feeling the hurt pretty significantly from the Saigor. Elsewhere in the meantime, you can see the Corporal here once again forcing off the Prince. He does have 420 weapon strength, so he really doesn't give a damn about the, what the Prince is thinking and can just force him off. Well, in the meantime, in the back line, it is, things are completely over for most of this shooting as the Chaos Warhounds, the Sons of Goros, and the Butcher of Calcum Guard run mop up and uh, it's basically clean up an Isle 9 back there. That said, Balance of Power, although it looks very much in my favor, should not be considered completely my favorite here. I have no front line essentially at this point uh, and my opponent still does have quite a few troops. He still does have these two units of Leon Reavers, he still does have some archers, quite a lot of spears, some Lothan Seaguard and those sorts of troops and a lot of healthy white lines back here. 73 miles on this unit, they're basically full. And this unit on okay HP so definitely not terrible. That said, with as we force breaks we're able to pursue and my opponent just very pressured here on micro perhaps. Uh, not the most experienced of players and because of that he's not able to quite keep up and we're able to continuously pound different angles. And he's often not, not keeping up. He, over here, he's trying to snipe down Malagor, who only has 15 armor and a little bit of missile resist, but really, Archer's not that good at killing these sorts of troops. And you can see the Saigor here is going to start flinging his boulders into this pack of archers. Uh, so th or actually, first into this pack here with the Gorbal, because we were trying to save our Gorbal from certain doom. And uh, Gorbal, you know, despite his 100 armor, he has very bad melee defense. So, especially Spears, over time, they will whittle him down. That said, rocks continue flying in. The uh, Eye of Morsleep still has 16, or 6. 16, not 6, rounds of ammo. And it's definitely going to be applying the pressure over here. The Butcher's Calcum are still on 12 miles, doing some monstrous work against these spears. And I have Morsley just teeing off on those Lothan Sea Guards, sending them flying, leaving a whole bunch of red smears on the ground. And uh, really raking in those skills up to 136 there. Balance of power is shifting ever further in my favor. And it's kind of funny because my opponent still has quite a bit that potentially could recover, but now, as obviously the mobility game was not strong for my opponent, and as his units are out, they are going to be run off the map. You can see the Illyrian Reavers here trying to do something, but getting heckled by the Ungor Raiders and broken uh, over here. The Cavalry Pocket does manage to, alongside the Gorbal, encircle the Prince. And although these Spearmen are going to try to interfere, they are going to start getting smeared into the dust by the very angry Psychor Summit, uh, and just completely getting dumpstered. So definitely some rough stuff, and in come the Ungor Raiders, in comes Malagor, of course. He does have something wicked this way it comes, so we'll be able to get that leadership debuff and potentially just make this pocket snap and flee, especially if some terror, Saigor is close enough to invoke terror. And you can see these poor spearmen waver and break, and suddenly my opponent is suffering army losses over here. So the Butcher's looking to feast upon some Lothan Seaguard, but it's too little too late, as my opponent's army simply buckles. So a fun little game where my opponent tried to get the kind of the jump on me, didn't really... Guarantee was running high elves and then just started up and I wasn't really ready for it and I didn't really have the best composition. I think the front line here, Angor, it's not necessarily what you want. Uh, I do think that if I was reordering this, 
Uh, I would probably try to swap some of these guys out for perhaps a few a few gores, maybe the Gore Regiment of Renown. Uh, just try to re-align re the list a little bit. But uh, besides that, it performed rather well. Um, against the Kite build, you do have all those Cygor summons. You've got your normal Cygor, you've got or the Eye of Morsleep, not really a normal Cygor, but you've got another Cygor there. And if your opponent brings, say, a bunch of large and tries to be annoying that way, you do have the Butchers of Kalkengard, you do have the Sons of Goros, especially those two units. You can really tag team, say, a dragon and bring it into, down to the muck, especially with the Gorbul throw into the mix. Now, my opponent here obviously did struggle a bit with the micro. Uh, one of the big problems with running a wide build, as well as if you're inexperienced, the micro is an uh, issue. you got you got to try to keep... in. On top of all your units, my opponent allowing some of his white lines to just overextend meant that while some of his units were completely eradicated, others were not in a position to support. So you can see these two units basically in mint condition at the end game. Uh, who got basically wasted? They didn't. They weren't in a good position. Uh, and so in the late game, when, when the butchers and the side, the I have more even cyber summons were still around kicking. These guys just weren't enough to balance to uh, fix the balance of power or to win the game. As for the uh, units in general, I was I was actually pretty impressed with the Eye of Morsley, but it seemed to be hitting pretty dead on, which was pretty nice. And uh, the uh, Gorbel also did a surprising amount of work. 65 kills, definitely not bad. Uh, and he did pressure off the Prince. Whenever the Prince tried to dive in and be a pain in the rear, we really beat the snot out of him. Now for my opponent here, Christina Gray, my main critique would be the lack of a caster. Uh, there are builds you can get away with without a caster. I've done this a few times on the channel myself, but I think that in general you do want to bring magic, unless you've got something very specific in mind that simply must sacrifice magic. <laughs> uh, which I don't think this build, it's so wide, you do not need to give up a mage. Even a dirt cheap trash caster with like, for like 500 gold, <laughs> with nothing except one or two spells, would be worth it over, say, you know, spears. You, you can sacrifice you know, spears for that. Second of all, I don't think slow. Immobile builds are very good against Beastmen. Now, what my opponent might have been going for here is actually a build to counteract Cygors, because Cygor spam, of course, is very potent against elite infantry. It's very potent to a less extent, but still very potent against heavy cavalry and uh, cavalry blobs. And uh, the Beastmen don't necessarily have... They do struggle a bit against monsters, but if you've got sort of Butchers of Kalkengard and spells and that, it might not be that much of an issue. So I feel like my opponent was trying to go very wide here and deny me the max value out of the Cygor, which he kind of did. But uh, I do think you need some more mobility. I do think you need to be a bit more agile. And honestly, if I'd brought a very rush-heavy melee build with the Beastmen with, say, a bunch of Bestigors and, like, in some chariots or more Minotaurs, this build would have crumpled like a, like a wet paper bag, in my opinion. Uh, because the White Lions just do not have that tankiness to sustain a long fight in the front line. Those archers would get immediately set upon once the line fell. Or Hell, the line might not even fall. The Bestigors could still potentially be wiping out those White Lions when, while units were... Other units were swamp swamping them already, like dogs or uh, butchers. And the two Lyrian Reavers simply are not enough, in my opinion, to protect the back line. So those are my two cents there. Uh, I, Otherwise, it was a bit of a fun game, and I do hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you found it entertaining, and uh, perhaps give you some sneaky ideas on how to be a cyber spamming sw comeback. Uh, so, without further ado, I guess that is it for the video. I do hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, as usual, any comments, criticism, questions, leave them down below, and I'll do my best to respond as soon as I can. I do thank you all for watching, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.